Um, welcome, welcome. We are so excited to have everybody here. It is live with Chris and Liz. So for those of you who are just joining or are new to this series, um, Chris and myself throughout the entire month uh, switch off on Wednesdays covering Lunch and Learn. But then the last Wednesday of the month, we're lucky enough to get to join together. So I think, I don't know about you, Chris, but this is certainly the one I enjoy the most and I'm most excited about. So um, thank you for joining. I'm so happy to always be sharing the stage with you. I know. It's so fun. I've known you for a while now, so it's cool to think that we're working together. And I love these because um, I already got some DM'd questions for today. And I think people just like asking their questions and knowing that we come from both that lived experience clinical piece. So I'm always hyped, I'm excited. I'm yeah. super excited for everyone joining us today. Hi and welcome. It'll be fun as it always is. So a couple of updates, please make sure you put in the comment stream um, where you're calling, joining from. I always say calling from. I know <laughs> it's like it's a telethon. It's not. Um, but questions throughout. So Chris and I actually have a ton of questions that have been pre-submitted. So we are going to work our way through those. Um, if we don't answer your specific question, it is because we are assuming we've already answered it in another way. So sometimes we don't answer everyone because we answer one and it covers two or three. Um, the other piece is that we may just not get to it, in which if that's the case, we do add it to a document and try our best to get to it later. So please say hi, let us know where you're joining from and submit questions that you have or topics that you wanna make sure we cover so that we can do that today. A couple of housekeeping as always, this is not intended to replace therapy. This is intended to be educational content where Chris and myself share our personal and, perspect and professional perspective, uh, but we're really not providing treatment and we shouldn't be doing that. This is of course not a crisis line. So if you're feeling unsafe or suicidal, please call 911, go to your local emergency room or call the National Suicide Prevention Line, which in the US is 1-800 273-8255, but depending on where you are, that number will vary. Um, a couple of updates that I always want to make sure that we go over is what we have coming up. So the first and biggest thing is that our International OCD Foundation Conference is coming up in just a week and a half. I cannot believe it will be here a week from Friday, um, and I'm so excited to get to see you all there and to hopefully connect virtually. While this is a virtual conference and a lot of it is held through Zoom, it is meant to be really, really interactive. So I know for those that are professionals, you can join Chris and I will be at the professional networking events, which are every day after the talks. And of course, you can get CEUs throughout the conference weekend. And if you're not a professional, you're an individual or a family member or a supporter of somebody with OCD, there is going to be talks specific for you. So be sure you go to iocdf.org and make sure you register if you haven't already. Chris, do you want to share a little bit about what the conference means to you and why you recommend people attend? Yeah. So my first conference was when I was in therapy, I was in treatment, but I was still pretty severe. It actually was down in San Diego and um, my family, uh, I have some family down there and I was planning on going a couple days and spending the night, but my OCD got too bad. But that's actually where I first saw Liz um, speak and, and she's around my age. And I just remember seeing her talk and talking about getting treatment and getting better. And also um, meeting people, I, I think the community was the biggest part. It was the first time I met other people with OCD. And I remember leaving and I felt very, very disappointed because I couldn't stay an additional day. I was just having too many obsessions, too many compulsions. But I remember telling my mom on the drive home, like, I think I can do this. I feel like other people have gotten better. I feel really inspired. And over the years, just the communities, the constant learning, um, and the feeling of home and feeling of being understood. I would say, you know, my last point is that I, I, it's the one place where I feel fully understood. So I tell people all the time that this conference will change your life. It will change the, the course of your treatment. It will change how you feel about yourself and it'll change your, uh, you know, your circle of friends. So please go. It's amazing. It's incredible. And the virtual component is um, doesn't feel like it's less than it feels like it's just as as uh, amazing as the conference always is. I agree. And it's pretty cool because the virtual allows us to also record sessions. So for those of us that register, there may be two or three at one time we want to watch. We can go back and watch those later. And so that's certainly a feature that makes it extra exciting or extra beneficial. A couple of other updates. Um, but until then, to register for the conference, go to onlineocdconference.org. That's online ocdconference.org and that's where you'll register. Of course, the Peace of Mind community is where 
everything that we do is housed within under the OCD, IOCDF umbrella. So if you go to IOCDF.org forward slash peace of mind, this is our virtual community landing page. So this is where you're going to see the live stream schedule, upcoming events, but also the place where you can submit topics and questions that you want to make sure we cover. And that's what Chris and I try our best and are going to be doing today. And we encourage you to please post there because we look at it and it really helps us make sure we're developing and offering content that you want to see. A couple of awesome, uh, exciting live streams that I want to touch base on. Ethan Smith will be doing a live stream on Tuesday, next Tuesday, October the 5th, and he is going to be doing this. It says Just Ethan, but it won't be Just Ethan. This time it's going to be focused on self-compassion and values, and it's going to feature the amazing Kim Quinlan. So for those of you who don't know Kim, go follow her on Instagram. She's absolutely incredible. And she actually, I will grab it, but she just um, released an amazing self-help book for self-compassion and OCD. Hold on, I have to get it. While she's getting it, um, congrats, Kim. Just incredible, I'm incredible. So that I want to make sure I share it with y'all. Um, and I know Chris knows Kim as well. And so this is the first actual, um, first ever actually, workbook that is focused on self-compassion for OCD, right? A lot of us use lots of different um, workbooks and a lots of different things to encourage people to engage in self-compassion, but there's not one specific for OCD. So Kim, 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 she is awesome. Make sure you follow her on Instagram and uh, join Ethan's just Ethan next Tuesday where Kim will be the special guest. And then of course, our next live event is a week from, um, Today, actually, next Wednesday, I am going to host a Lunch and Learn with Dr. John Grayson. John is somebody who I absolutely love, and we connect a lot and talk and focus on uncertainty, and that's what we're going to talk about next week. We're going to talk about the pitfalls of ERP. So when we often see ERP not work, why doesn't it work? What does the word treatment resistance mean? And how can we make ERP more successful? I am actually pitching that there is a little bit of a special potion um, that most people are missing. So that special ingredient tends to be missing when a lot of people do ERP. So next week we'll be covering that. Make sure you join and um, attend. Chris, talk a little bit about, if you don't mind, if you want to share some of the upcoming live streams you have coming up. Yeah, so I think um, after that, isn't it going to be you and I for mm -hmm. OCD Awareness Week? So OCD Awareness Week is the 10th through the, the 16th. So Friday, or sorry, Sunday, the 10th through Saturday, the 16th. So Liz and I will be back in two weeks doing another Q&A. Uh, really excited about that one because that's OCD Awareness Week. And, and I think that week means so much to me because it's really our opportunity to get the word out there, just what OCD really is and what people can do to support the community. And then I think what I'm most hyped about uh, the, following, the next day, that Thursday, um, the 14th, I believe, um, we're going to have a lead advocate and national advocate um, live stream. So that's going to be Thursday. I always get the times wrong because I always think of Pacific Standard Time. I think it's four o'clock our time. I think seven o'clock East Coast, but it's going to be Liz and myself. It's also going to be with Ethan Smith, Val. Uh, we have Katie and we also have Tom, Tom Smalley. So we're all going to be talking. And I think you know, I see the magic when we're all together. I just think we're a really great group of people. So I really, really, really encourage you not only to show up for those live streams during OCD Awareness Week, but what OCD Awareness Week is about is getting other people educated. So if you have friends, family, neighbors, people that you think might be impacted by OCD or a loved one, or just people that you want to learn more about the disorder that you're dealing with, please come to those live streams during OCD Awareness Week. Absolutely. They are so important and uh, just really critical. So let's hop in. All right. I know we have questions. We already have one submitted. I know we have a bazillion on other forms. So let's let's start with the first one submitted. So Chris, Molly at 1109 said, how does one find a way to cope with the ambiguity that OCD feeds off of the potential stakes, consequences, outcomes of not following that compulsion when it can be so high? So we're talking about life or death. So Molly is talking a little bit about magical thinking, but just in general, how do we not engage in compulsions when the risk feels so high, so scary, right? And she's talking about when it's impacting or feeling like it's a life or death situation. Well, first of all, Molly, amazing last name. <laughs> Throw that out there. Um, you know what? It's such a good question. And I think that, you know, as somebody who lives with OCD besides just treating it, I mean, you're correct. It doesn't feel like there's going to be a slight inconvenience. It literally feels like that compulsion is the thing protecting you from life or death. Almost like death is inevitable. And if you don't do this compulsion, your life is going to be taken. And that's why I think psychoeducation is so important. You really have to sit down and understand the disorder. And I remember when I was in treatment, 
I, I've always played sports my whole life. And my therapist said, look, just like you really understand the other team and you really learn about the sport you're playing, we got to learn about OCD. We got to understand how it works so we know how to beat it. And I remember her talking about different cognitive distortions that are unique to OCD. And one of them was this overestimation of consequence from danger. And it really made sense to me, this idea that every single time OCD threatens you, it's never that it's going to be you're going to have a headache or you're gonna bump into someone, or you're gonna be slightly inconvenienced for an hour, it's always goes straight to worst case. You're gonna die, you're gonna rape someone, you're gonna harm someone, you're gonna kill someone. And so I started to learn about the boy that cries wolf, and that's how OC started to feel. So even knowing that though, obviously didn't take that, that um, fear away. But I think one thing that Jonathan Grayson talks about, and I'm excited for Liz's live stream next week, is we have to learn to live a life of uncertainty. And so what was powerful for me is learning on all the different places that I live with uncertainty in my life. I live with uncertainty driving on LA freeways, living in California with earthquakes. And so I started to recognize that there's power in not waking up every day and trying to control. So for me, I had to make that conscious effort in ERP to really start to have that acceptance component that sure, there might be a percentage that I may die or a family member will die. But what I've been forced to do in order to prevent that has completely stripped me of my happiness, my life and my family around me's life. So that's why we start slow with ERP. We really start slow. So if you can't full on give up that compulsion, try to reduce it, try to put it off and start to learn through ERP. That's when we talk about that inhibitory learning, that all of the times that you are dropping those compulsions, those catastrophic outcomes don't come true. So start small, learn to live with that uncertainty on a smaller end and keep growing until you finally get to that point that you realize that OCD lies. Last thing I'll say, Chris Bear did a really good speech once and he said, OCD lies always, period, full stop. And that's something powerful to remember. Yeah. And, you know, I think that one of the things that we really have to keep in mind is, and I, and I always say this, right, but like, are the rituals actually preventing us, right? So oftentimes we're doing these rituals and compulsions because we feel like if we don't, there's this terrible thing. We know that's not rational, but no matter how many times you do that ritual, do you actually get 100% certainty that you're safe or that something bad isn't going to happen? No, you don't. So is the value really in the ritual or is in the value what we're placing on the ritual, if that makes sense. And so one of the things John does, a simple thing he talks about, and we'll talk more about this next week with him, is having people change their wording to like, I'm choosing to hand wash, I'm choosing to ritualize, because it mm. reminds us that it is still a choice. We In the moment, we feel like we don't have a choice when there's these huge consequences that feel like they're glooming. But the reality is, is that if we don't treat it as a choice. That is why those consequences feel more real compared to us being able to slowly see like we're choosing that and we're actually choosing to give those thoughts more power. Yeah. And shout out to Molly for asking the first question. That's why we're here today is to answer your question. So please shoot those out there and hopefully that answered it, Molly. Um, I'm going to jump to one that I got from a DM when I was promoting this live stream. And it says for Liz and Chris, what is one thing that really helped you get better? I know there are probably many things that you did, but what's that one thing that you found most helpful? Oh, this is a hard one. You know, I think that um, I could go through down, I could go down the speech, right, of ERP and how much it works and all these things. But the reality for me is it was buying into a lifestyle of uncertainty. And it was really when I started to choose and realize I could choose the life that I wanted. So I did active ERP really intensely through inpatient treatment when I was 15. I relapsed. I went back when I was 17. And I would say even in early adulthood, I was kind of just like surviving with OCD, right? Sometimes when I would say, oh yeah, I'm doing fine. Doing fine meant like I was doing, I, I, I had enough relief in a day to be able to function, but I wasn't actually free from OCD. I wasn't actually free from my thoughts. I didn't experience that freedom until later in adulthood when I really decided and understood the concepts of treatment. Treatment wasn't about tunnel vision ERP. That's how I had done it for years. And so it was this constant game of whack-a-mole of every time an intrusive thought came up, I was doing ERP for it, doing ERP for it. Instead, it was learning that uncertainty and ERP has a bigger concept. It has a bigger core. And when you buy into all of that and you treat everything with that, that lens, right? You look at everything with that lens, you respond to it through that lens and through that tunnel, the thoughts can't gain the power. And that's when I really realized, oh, 
accepting life with OCD doesn't mean I have to accept suffering. I think there was a long time where I thought it meant I had to accept I would always suffer. I would have to accept that I always struggled. And so I was constantly just doing ERP for every small thing compared to accepting that like I can have an OCD diagnosis and not have to struggle and be able to live in a a values-based life that isn't hard. I think sometimes we hear this message of like, even if you struggle, you can still choose your values. And so then we start to think, oh, living values-based life means that like we still do it despite feeling bad and that we're always going to feel bad. You don't have to accept that. And so the biggest thing that helped me was accepting the whole picture, accepting and understanding the entire concept versus ERP for my specific struggles that day. Yeah, I'll just add quickly because I think you added so much. Um, I think it was when I finally, for me, I made OCD treatment the utmost priority. My family did, my mom did actually, and I did. It was just the thing. And so I hear a lot of people or I have a lot of clients that will come in and they'll do a few sessions and then be very kind of like wishy-washy about the treatment. But for me, it's like it was the most important thing. And when I made it the focus of what I was doing, that's when I started to get better. A hundred percent. So Chris, one of the questions that we got is how can I tell the difference between generalized anxiety disorder and OCD? I've been diagnosed with both and I sometimes find it difficult. Yeah. So I get this question a a lot from clients or I see clients misdiagnosed and I would say uh, there's a couple like beginner factors that we could look at that's different. One thing about generalized anxiety disorder is typically the anxiety is over, around kind of like everyday things, you know? So it might be you have to give a speech in front of class or there's layoffs at work and you're a little bit worried about your position at work or you're going on your first date. So when you talk about generalized anxiety disorder, you're gonna hear things that the average person also worries about. Just obviously the anxiety is greater and it's debilitating and that's where the D in disorder comes from. Whereas OCD, you're going to notice that it can be obsessions about something that isn't even occurring. You know, most people with generalized anxiety disorder start to worry as they get near the event, the event happens and then it starts to pass. Whereas we know with OCD, you could have an event next year and find yourself, you know, obsessive and, you know, ruminating about it. Also, I would say there's compulsions involved, you know, generalized anxiety, somebody may feel anxious, but maybe they'll avoid or they'll kind of fidget a little bit, but ultimately they're not doing these ritualistic behaviors that we see in OCD. So OCD can create anxiety. Obviously, you know, somebody is obsessing over something and then doing ritual Uh, to try to prevent that bad thing from happening, they're going to experience anxiety, but you're going to see those obsessions. You're going to see that that, um, response with the compulsion, safety behaviors, avoidance, et cetera. That's also why we go into subtypes. So people learn and recognize that these aren't just typical things that, you know, the average person worries about. These are things that are ego dystonic, counterintuitive to the person. And they're worried about being something or doing something that they're not. I have a question because I, I think it's one I get often and I and I wonder myself is how much do you feel like it actually matters, right? So once mm-hmm. we're in treatment and we're doing active exposures and we're doing CBT, does it really matter? Like, do, do we need to analyze, is this GAD? Is this OCD? Like, what is this? No, I'm glad you asked that. I don't think so. I mean, I, I, what I see in, instead when people try to do that, it actually makes the disorders worse. So especially if you have OCD, because we love to to scrutinize everything and pull it apart and really, really try to figure it out. So what I noticed with the clients that have been diagnosed with both, and look, I got diagnosed with both. I think my general anxiety disorder probably came just from having OCD because it wasn't something I normally dealt with. But when I see clients trying, is this my anxiety? Is this the OCD? What do I do? That actually makes it worse. So to me, it's like, look, let's look at that main couple of concepts that work for both that living with uncertainty and then my mindset with anxiety and OCD is we instead of tiptoeing around or instead of running up to it and running away we power through it so regardless of what it is we're really learning to kind of face that to go after it to learn to live with it and live with uncertainty absolutely um so Chris do you want to ask one of yours and then we'll go into some of the live ones as well sure yeah I was going to get to live but I'll ask one of theirs I I really like this question because I want to save people a lot of wasted time. Uh, My therapist is saying I can't get better with ERP. So she is recommending EMDR and tapping on my forehead at my temples. Do those work for OCD? Ah, good question. (laughs) Um, And I love this because I I think it's really important for us to talk about it, you know, is what are evidence-based interventions? I was talking about this with one of our amazing clinicians here yesterday is like, 
where can someone go and just find a list of if I have this disorder, what are the recommended treatments? And I don't know if that really exists. So, so I plan to work on that here. But right, it's really important for us to know and understand when we talk about evidence-based treatments, what we mean by that from a clinical perspective is that there are treatments that have been researched and have been studied and that we know are the most effective for specific disorders. While CBT, for example, is an evidence-based intervention for a lot of different disorders. CBT is used for substance use disorder, it's used for PTSD, it's used for OCD, it's used for generalized anxiety disorder, it's used for eating disorders. But the type of CBT differs depending on the diagnosis. So if you live with PTSD, the most evidence-based interventions are cognitive processing therapy, CPT, and prolonged exposure, PE. If you live with OCD, the most effective evidence-based intervention is ERP, exposure with response prevention. So depending on your disorder, there are specific interventions, and it's critical that you stay in that lane and really give it a try with a ERP specialist. EMDR is not proven to work for OCD. Um, any of the sort of tapping and those sort of things do not have research or evidence behind them. Now, I am not, I will, I will make this clear, like I am not here saying that some people don't find benefit in some of these interventions. For some people, they find them beneficial or they find them to be helpful, sometimes as an adjunct or to get you ready or whatever it might be. So I don't wanna discount if somebody says, oh, well, EMDR kind of worked for me, but the research shows and tells us that ERP is the gold standard first line behavioral intervention for OCD. And so if someone is saying ERP won't work for your OCD, I would recommend finding a new provider who specializes in OCD and ERP. Yeah, mic drop. The only thing I was gonna add you already took, I was gonna say if a therapist ever tells you that, what my guess is, is maybe they either don't know ERP or they know enough for people that come in that are extremely, extremely mild cases. And as soon as it becomes too difficult, they're kind of throwing their hands up like, hey, I can't handle this. Right. I agree. So let's hop into some of the live questions because I want to yeah. make sure we always answer those. So the next one is, um, so two actually kind of go together. And so the first one is, how do I get on with my life? I can't get rid of the fear of the pandemic. I don't go out. I've been alone for a year and a half and I'm too terrified to get it. Meaning, I think meaning COVID. Yeah, you know what, I relate to this. I mean, I, without going into my medical history, I'm immunocompromised, something that I've had since a child. And so I've talked to my doctor and obviously I, I've gotten the vaccine. I'm going to get the booster because that's best for my health. Um, and I'm nervous, obviously, because I have that added kind of component to it. But what I've recognized and what a kind of a commitment I've made to my life is that what I used to do, because I had a really bad health OCD, is anytime I'd get advice from a doctor, I wouldn't listen. I would kind of go 20 times over. And I started to question how come I wasn't willing to listen to doctors, but I was listening to OCD, which gathered stuff from the internet and was based on kind of just like panic and worries. And so for me, I make smart choices. You know, I, I don't um, do things that are erratic or do things that put myself in harm. But I also recognize that we have a lot more education now on the, the virus. And so the things that a lot of my clients were doing maybe last March uh, when we didn't know and everybody was panicking and wiping down groceries and stuff, you know, we've learned in the medical community that's not something to fear, but OCD doesn't care. It says what if, and it wants to be extra cautious. So Beth, the best advice that I'd give you is the advice I'd give anybody dealing with any type of OCD is this doesn't have to be something you do overnight and you don't have to jump to your tens tomorrow. Start to, you know, sit down with a pen and paper and start to write out all the things you either avoid doing or overdo because of your fear and start to rank those from easiest to hardest and start you know, really addressing those easy things. So I was working with a client with similar fears and we started with them just simply opening their door, walking outside, standing on their welcome mat for five seconds and going back in. And, you know, long story short, after doing ERP for about four to five months, now they're back to living a, a pretty normal life. So don't think that tomorrow you have to be back to how it was before the virus. Make sure that you start to approach against it. But remember, more and more time that you avoid going out and avoid doing anything is just going to solidify OCD's fears and it's going to become even more difficult to push through. 100%. You know, remember that avoidance feeds the monster the same way compulsions do. And how can we... How can we stay in this lane of OCD rules versus CDC rules, right? You can follow CDC guidelines, you can follow your doctor's guidelines without following OCD guidelines. And OCD is gonna wanna latch on to both and create so many more barriers, so many more things than what a doctor would say is healthy. I'm gonna pull the question from Misa Trotman at 12.19. I always have to do the math, your time, Jess. 
Um, it, it's more of a comment, but I think it's a good topic we can we can address quickly. Misa's talking about her college age son doesn't go to the conference and doesn't really have hope and treatment because of this concept of like, you will always struggle. So what I wanted to ask you is one thing that I hear, maybe Misa's son is saying the same thing, is when people find out it's a chronic disorder, they have this attitude, Liz, like, well, what's the point? It's chronic. I'm going to be suffering forever. There's no point in going to these conferences. There's no point in getting help. Like, I'm going to suffer forever. Sure, I can get better, but it's chronic, it's chronic, it's chronic. And I think this is something you and I have been both passionate about. It's like, we got to make sure that that messaging is not what you're hearing. Because sure, it's chronic, but we have to chronically work out all the time and eat healthy and sleep every day to stay, uh, you know, to stay alive. So we, we know how to handle things. So how do you kind of address either with yourself or with your clients or people in the community when they have this mindset of just what's the point? It's chronic. Yeah, I think it's really important. And this is what we were talking a little bit about earlier is that how can we accept our OCD diagnosis, but not accept that that means it has to be a negative label on our life, right? Like you can have OCD and still fully function, just like you could have diabetes and still fully function and people don't have to know. However, if we tr want to try to like avoid having the label at all or avoid the fact that we have OCD and we're in denial, our symptoms tend to be right worse because what we're doing is we're actually not addressing them because we're trying to pretend like they don't exist and they're not there. So to me, it's really about an acceptance model of accepting you have OCD, but not accepting that you always have to struggle. That's the really key piece is that you can have OCD and accept a full functioning life, not I have OCD and I have to accept that like that means I'm always going to struggle and it's always going to be really hard. And so that to me was the big shift I talked about earlier that I think was critical for me and I think is critical for everybody else because it will allow you to fully engage in treatment because you're not accepting this half-life from OCD. When Chris talked about one of the things that really worked for him, right, it was the way he engaged and committed to ERP. He wouldn't have been able to fully engage and commit to it if he didn't believe recovery was possible, if he didn't believe that treatment was going to work. And so you really have to kind of get get that hope up, get that motivation up, understand that acceptance doesn't mean we accept suffering. It means we accept the diagnosis and we accept management of symptoms. And Misa, give them this link when it's done. I mean, I think, you know, like I said, seeing Liz speak, that was the first person I kind of like met with OCD. I don't even think I went up and said hi or anything, but she was the first person I met with OCD around my age. And I, I related and it was really life changing for me when I went back to my therapist, I had a renewed feeling. So have him watch this, you know, let him know that he can get better. Absolutely. So um, Patricia at 1120 said, can the temperament of the OCD sufferer impact treatment? Would love to hear your thoughts on this, Chris. Yeah. I mean, you know, I always tell people, because people always ask us, I wonder if you get the same question, Liz. It's always like, what's the success rate and how long is it going to take? And it's hard to answer because it isn't a one size fits all. It really does depend on the person's mindset, temperament, et cetera. So when I have a client that comes in and they want to be here and they're willing to do the work, ERP doesn't fail in my opinion and, you know, ACT and all these other, you know, values based and mindfulness and all these, you know, other components. But, you know, the, the evidence based ERP treatment for OCD is so, so successful for so many people and if they have to include medication. And so it, it does impact it. I mean, if, if, if somebody has a tendency to be very, very cautious and they want to, um, you know, think through everything and they want to challenge every exposure, or if they're not really motivated or if they're not really into it, or if they get, you know, straight to anger, et cetera, those things can impact it. So I really, you know, one thing that I do as a clinician and, and it probably comes from my lived experience is I really have that, you know, question. I, Liz says it really well, um, with John Grayson is like, I have that conversation with them. Like, what does your life look like? What have you lost? What have you visioned for yourself? Do you see how the OCD is impacting you? What do you want to get back? Let's kind of build your ERP around that. Let's start to get you back into things that you like. So if a person can get on board, if a person can really decide that they want to do this, that's the most important. Because I've worked with people with all different temperaments and all different, you know, things like that. And they've gotten better. I think the, the key things, though, is does that person want to get better? Are they willing to do the work? And are they ready? Absolutely. Right. It's really, it's a combination of all of the above. And I think that we get that question all the time of like, how long will we be at McLean? How long will we be in intensive treatment? And the answer is it really depends, right? Because it's not just temperament too. It's also 
the complexity, right? Some of us have, some people have complex grief, complex trauma, other things going on. Like we can't just put everyone in a one size fits all, like OCD is treated in a vacuum model because we can't treat OCD and think these other things won't then come up and be increased in different ways. So we need to address the whole person and it's really dependent individually. Yeah, and I'll add real quick, you know, I was re-watching the um, our keynote from the OCD SoCal, which I got the the video, so we'll have to put it up after the big conference. Um, I think people need to see it. But one thing that I, I felt when I was watching all of your stories, I didn't watch mine back, that'd be creepy, but when I was watching your stories, it's like, I felt like all of us had a fire and a drive. And I think that's really what it was, is all of us said enough. We're done. We're tired of living like this. We we see ourselves as better. We we deserve better. We have better for ourselves. And when we all kind of made that decision that we had more to live for than the disorder, I really, really felt the power of all of our words. So that's what I think is most important. I don't think people are born more likely or have a more like, you know, I think it's do you have that drive to get better? A hundred percent. And I also think that it um sometimes it takes a while to build that drive, right? Don't be frustrated if your kid doesn't have it the first time they go to therapy. Like that's normal, right? It's normal for it to take time and for us to believe and understand and have experiences with other people who've had success before we realize, oh, success can happen for me. Like Chris said, that conference was kind of the turning point for him to say like, I can do this, right? I don't want to, it's going to be hard, but I can. Yeah. We have a question from Aya at 1220 your time, Jess. How can we resist doing compulsions with a subconscious constantly telling us to get the compulsion done? It could be literally hours and I still have the urge to complete this compulsion to ease off of the anxiety. Amazing question and really important for us to cover. I think this is what I would define as white knuckling, right? So when we um, have the urge to engage in a compulsion and we don't do it and we find ourselves just kind of resisting and pushing through where we're like white knuckling, right? Like I am not going to do that compulsion. I'm not going to do that compulsion. But then a few hours later, the urge is still there. What does that tell me? Well, what that tells me as a clinician is that you were holding on to the compulsion. And what I mean by that is that you're still thinking about it. You're still anxious about it. And you actually are still imagining or keeping the compulsion as an option that you can do to feel better. And as long as we do any of that, we are still going to be triggered until we engage in that compulsion. That's why when we say, I want you to do ERP all the way, I want you to lean all the way in. What we mean by that is that if this is contaminated, right, it's not just, you know, touching the bottle and being scared and then like white knuckling through until we can wash our hands, but it's going all the way, right? It's cross contaminating. It's touching our water bottle to our phone. It's doing all these things because what we're doing in that moment is saying like, yes, this is contaminated and I'm taking this risk and I am spreading it everywhere to where I can't undo it. Compulsing or doing, doing rituals, I'm sorry, preventing rituals. So doing exposures a little bit where like we're doing them and we're just sitting waiting for the anxiety to reduce it's going to stay there, right? Because we're waiting to get relief. Instead, I want you to lean all the way in, which means you're fully accepting that I don't care if I get relief. I don't care if I get contaminated. I'm, I'm doing this exposure all the way, not you're doing it and holding on. Yeah. And I'll add too. when I was doing treatment, the thing that didn't work and it was everything that Liz said, but it, what also didn't work is like, I, I would, you know, let's say do the exposure and then it was time to, to re, you know, not respond by do, not doing the compulsion. If I just kind of sat there, like Liz said, and kind of gave it the option or I was kind of like compulsively ruminating, should I do it? What's going to happen? Or like Molly said in the comments, like, oh, maybe if I just did a second check, nothing bad would happen. Like Liz said, I still gave the option. So what really helped for me is like, I've made that decision. I did the exposure. I'm doing the response prevention and now it's time to get on with my day. So if that meant, you know, going to the store and go grocery shopping, or if I had to go and, and meet up with a friend or whatever it was, it's like, I'm done. And so when I didn't give OC that crack of the door to kind of come back in and I chose to move on, bringing the anxiety and the fear with me, but tolerating and accepting it, that's when it was just like, I, you know, it's almost like a spoiled child. OC was like, well, I guess I'm not going to win this time. And you know, then we would start to notice that it wouldn't be like the hours or I noticed it wouldn't be the hours and hours anymore. Absolutely. Next question. Um, and I was actually thinking it might be kind of fun for us to do like a rapid fire question answer and sure. see how many we can get through quickly. Um, cause I've been talking way too much. So Beth at 1121, you have to get comfortable that this is life and sometimes things can happen. Your worst fear may happen, but not because of OCD, but because it's life, things can happen. Um, absolutely. Totally agree with all of those questions. Sorry. I, it wasn't a question, but agree with your comment. Um, 
super important seeing what OCD says. I can have, um, I love that your are uh, Barbara at 1123 is saying that we may always struggle, but it's not near what it used to be. You can now have joy and happiness because you certainly deserve that. Um, Molly said, I think that part of getting stuck, the part I get stuck on is knowing I could prevent something by taking that extra step. So many times that second chap check has prevented a bad outcome. Chris, can you talk about that for a second? Yeah, this idea that, um, so I was reading the comments too. Um, yeah, you know, that that's what I was kind of talking about is like this idea that that second check is going to provide the outcome. You know, what I, what I started to realize in my own care, and I don't know if this will help you, Molly, but I started to, to you know, as I was getting better and doing ERP, I started to recognize that it was less about preventing something bad from happening. And it was more about, I hated the way it made me feel. Because I did enough ERP to start to learn that, no, I wasn't going to get cancer because I drove by a house that was tenting for termites. Or, no, I wasn't going to like push my grandma down the stairs. So I got to a point where I started to recognize cognitively from the learning, from the ERP, that the things wouldn't happen. But it still felt like they would happen. And what my therapist and I talked about, which really was a game changer, is she's like, you've been doing this for so long. You know now. like You, you didn't know before the ERP, but you know now that the likelihood you're gonna push your grandma down the stairs is slim, but that feeling is what you're scared of. That feeling is what you're running from. And so it started to have me recognize that this isn't just a thought disorder. It's also something that makes us feel uncomfortable. And so when I started to embrace that feeling of discomfort and reframing that feeling of discomfort, meaning that I was fighting back against the OCD and expanding sort of like my, my comfort zone, when I would you know, not do the double check, did I push my grandma down the stairs and feel that anxiety, I started to wear that as a badge of honor and be like, awesome, that means I didn't give into the compulsion and I'm getting better. So also recognize that you know, you, you've you been doing this long enough, you know that it's OCD, it's the feeling that is also causing a lot of panic for you. So you gotta take that risk and it's the only way that you're gonna get true clarity and your freedom back. Totally agree. Next question is, what do you recommend when you're truly ready to do treatment, but your insurance surprises you with denying um, payment for treatment that's residential for this individual? Um, do you want to answer? Because I don't do sure. residential. Happy to answer it. So Lily, I think that I would say, and I will say to everybody watching, you have to be your strongest advocate. There's an amazing article by Fred Penzel on IOCDF.org about how you fight for insurance coverage and the way that you can use insurance to cover, even if they say that they won't. So like some of the things that are important to say and share with them. The second piece is there are programs that do accept insurance like Rogers Memorial and uh, McLean Boston. And so I definitely recommend reaching out to them. But sometimes just because insurance says no up front, you don't have to accept that for an answer. You can keep fighting for it to help make it happen. And some of the facilities can help walk you through this. Yeah. If I could add too, we do have an intensive outpatient program and we are in network with some insurances. Like we're in network with Kaiser's, one of them and a couple others. Um, but we on our end, at least our staff is before someone does an intensive outpatient program with us, we're getting a pre-authorization. We're finding out how much the insurance, we get that all in writing. So we do some of that. Unfortunately, sometimes, and Liz probably experiences this, they don't want to hear from us. Sometimes they want to hear from the, the patient themselves, but it's all about advocacy. And so we make sure to fight on our end. And I think usually when the person with and us fight together, we make things happen. You pay each month for your insurance. They may say no quickly because they just don't want to do it. But if you fight through it, you will get the help potentially that you need. Um, the next question is at 11 or sorry, 1235. Do you have any advice for OCD intrusive thoughts in conjunction with neurological disorders, executive functioning disorders? I'm they didn't go into the specifics of which one they were. I don't know if like ex executive functioning, if somebody's having difficulty with with just normal processing or um, I don't know if they can maybe um, uh, expand, but I was thinking when I first briefly read, walk, uh, read over it as like maybe somebody with OCD and tics or OCD and um, autism spectrum disorder, or I have worked with some clients that do have some executive functioning or they have um, processing. And what I like to do, and, and tell me if you agree, Liz, is, is if it's something that's neurological and it's not something that can be treated behaviorally, I always recommend working with someone that's that's going to focus solely on that. So 
um, you know, we can work in conjunction. I think to, despite what comorbidity you have, if it's something that we don't treat specifically, it's getting the help that you need for that other component and making sure to work in collaboration. But I've worked with people that have intellectual disabilities. I've worked with people that also have autism spectrum disorder. I've worked with people that have neurological tics. I've worked with people that have, um, you know, executive functioning and processing disorders. Sure, the pace might be different or um, there might need to be more education or there may need to be moving at a different speed. Um, but like I said, it's important to get kind of that collaboration if you are working with someone else, but it can be done. I don't think, I've never had a client where something else was going on that I'm just like, sorry, we can't ever treat the OCD. A hundred percent. So my advice would be to definitely get a full neuropsych assessment so that we can really understand the complexities and the ways that these disorders might interfere with OCD treatment or might make OCD treatment a little bit different, but we, we accommodate, right? And all of our patients are different. All of our patients have different background, different diagnosis, a different psychiatric or psychological history. It's our job to figure out how to appropriate na appropriately help them navigate treatment in a way that's going to be most beneficial. Next question at 1138 is, my son has religious moral OCD. He's gotten so much better since COVID and being away from church. Do you think it's possible to go back without making things bad again? Absolutely. And it actually breaks my heart. I mean, I think that I have so many clients that come in and they are people of faith. And I think that for all of us, whether you're agnostic, atheist, if you're Christian, you know, Muslim, whatever, you know, faith or spirituality or lack thereof that you have, I mean, that's an important part of our daily living. And so I do know that a lot of people will say they feel so much better if they stop going to church, they don't read the Bible, they stop wearing their cross. The problem about that is you're making choices based out of fear and not who you are. We only have one life to live. And if you're connection with your God is super important. You don't want to give that up simply because of OCD. So what may have to happen is if obviously going back to church is like a 10 on their suds level, if it's one of the most difficult things, sure, we don't start there. You know, we might look at a picture of a church or drive by it. But I always tell clients that my goal in treatment is to get them to live the life that they've always envisioned for themselves. So I've, I've seen it happen with so many of my clients and Liz's clients and anybody working with an OCD specialist. So what ERP is going to allow your son to do is going to allow him to start to expose him to some of those triggering, you know, religious thing, you know, themes that bother him, but learning through habituation, you know, inhibitory learning and through response prevention that he can tolerate that uncertainty, tolerate that discomfort. So I would have him work with an ERP specialist around specific exposures to get him back in church. And every time that a client does that, they're just so happy that they're back with their faith that that was important for them. Love it. And I just want to touch on that last question. Do you think it's possible to go back without making things bad again? It's really important that we remember avoidance doesn't actually help in the long run, right? So it feels like not going to church has made things so much better, but it probably hasn't, right? It's impacted different things for him, but he's avoiding something that's a value, something that's important, and we wouldn't want that. And so I, the reason I'm bringing that last piece up is that Try not to create an environment where things might not ever get bad again, because that's not realistic. So my point is, is that even if going back to church means there's some more triggers and it's difficult at first when they first return, um, of course, hopefully with a therapist and when appropriate, that doesn't mean you just pull back out and you say, oh, it's not possible. We push through it. Right. So things can be tough. Things can be triggering and we can still end up loving them with the right treatment and continuing to push through. We see this with school as well, where a lot of kids who weren't in school because of the pandemic, not being at school wasn't triggering as triggering for social anxiety or maybe OCD that's present at school. So there's this anxiety for parents of, oh, should we just homeschool forever? And my answer is always like, if homeschooling was your original plan and what you would do if OCD wasn't there, sure. But if you're making that decision for OCD, absolutely not, because they're going to want to go to college one day. They're going to want to have a job. And these, these issues, again, don't happen where we can just avoid them and get rid of them, right? We avoid them and they continue to be there until we can't avoid them anymore. Agreed. I'm glad you made that point about school. Um, we have a question at, I'm going to say my time because the math heart hurts, uh, 9.39 a.m. My OCD makes me imagine gay scenarios all day. It started with a what if I'm gay thought and now I'm getting aroused by the test. What should I do? So I'm not sure what, what the tests would be. Um, and so I think that 
it's really important to think about and, and work with your therapist together to understand if this is sexual orientation OCD. And if it is, we want to treat it as OCD. And so what we want to do is reduce the checking behaviors and engagement um, in any sort of rituals that are making this thought scary and making this thought more powerful. And um, so it's really important that you would work together to kind of create a treatment plan. It's easy for Chris and I to say, here's some exposures you would do, but I would want you to do those together with a provider. Yeah. And I, I would also add is that that's what's so horrible about OCD, because in real life, if we want to learn more about something, we do do research, we do do tests, you know, we want to go to a dentist that spend many years looking up and researching the latest treatments. But the problem for us and research backs us up is the more we try to figure something out, the more we doubt our thoughts and our, our certainty. And then we start to question our reality. So by doing those tests, I know it makes sense. Like, okay, I'll do this test, get an answer and move on with my life. By that very doing the test, you actually add doubt to the situation. It makes you feel more like you potentially might be gay. So then you do more tests, feel more gay, test gay, test gay, until you get to a point where you start to really believe it. So over time, like uh, Liz said, with your therapist, you got to learn to drop those, those uh, tests. Absolutely. Next question um, is at 11.41, does autism go along with OCD and anxiety? Yeah. So there's, I actually did a presentation on this recently and there's studies that show that there's um, as high as about a 30% comorbidity. So 30% of people with autism will have OCD. And part of that, is, I have a nephew that has both, he's nine, he has both um, autism and is showing signs of OCD. In autism, there's something that we call stemming and it's like repeating behavior. So for instance, my nephew can lay on, on his stomach and with his toy cars and just go back and forth and just watch obsessively the tire spin. However, that doesn't cause him to distress, he actually really enjoys it. So we know it's OCD and not autism when it starts to bring on distress. And so he's starting to show behaviors, for instance, that are just making him really stressed out and cry and not want to go to sleep. And so we do see that high comorbidity. I do believe it's because a lot of the same behaviors that we see in autism, that repetitiveness, that focus, um, liking to do the same thing over and over, obviously, we see that in OCD. So there is going to be a high 30% comorbidity. But one of the big questions I get is, can people with autism still get better with OCD? I love that the IOCDF is doing more and more talks about this because absolutely. Um, sometimes with, with clients with autism, especially if it's not as um, high functioning, they have a hard time dealing with that concept of like, maybe it will happen, maybe it won't, because for them, they need things to be much more concrete. So you might have to approach it slightly different. But I love working with clients with, with, with autism. I think they're great people. Um, I have family members members with autism and they really like once they really get it they really want to do the work so Carol there's absolute hope absolutely and I did a um, webinar as well two weeks ago on autism and OCD and I highly recommend watching it because we talk go into more detail about all of that and um, next question is what is this 11 sorry 1147 from Barbara what is the status on helping to make clergy understand religious and scrupulosity OCD yeah, so a couple thoughts. First of all, um, the the first record, I did a presentation on this, the first record of OCD ever is actually scrupulosity. It was with Martin Luther. And so um, it's super important. It's one of the oldest forms of it. I love our special interest groups here at the ICF. So uh, Katie O'Dunn, who's going to be part of the live stream that we're doing two weeks on Thursday, um, actually heads the... Um, the faith and OCD uh, special interest group. So there was a conference earlier this year, it was around my birthday in May, um, that actually brought individuals that are of faith, um, people with OCD and faith leaders um, together. My dad is, is very um, high up in the Catholic church around here. And I know that I've been working with him to educate people in his church. And I'm starting to see more and more faith leaders understand it because a lot of times my clients with scrupulosity don't want to do any exposures unless their, their uh, clergy sign off on it. And obviously we don't want to do reassurance, but sometimes I'll do that one conversation um, where we all connect and they're starting to get it more. So there's definitely a movement in the IOCF to do it. And Barbara, I would say if it's super passionate for you, um, please uh, email us. I think the email is info at iocdf.org. We can definitely connect you with Katie O'Dunn, or you can come to our live stream uh, Thursday the 14th at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Katie's going to be a part of that, um, and she'll help direct you with that. And there'll be a conference next year. So it's absolutely one of the IOCDF's missions. And thank you for bringing it up because it's super important. 100%. So Chris, um, I, I'll answer this next one. If you want to look at DMs and we'll, we'll get to any of those, we'll try to get to a couple before we wrap up. Um, so 
One question is, can we speak to the comorbidity of OCD and depression and when depression persists when OCD has been better managed? So this is a great question. So sometimes what we see is that there is an OCD and depression diagnosis and when OCD is treated, the depression gets better. Sometimes what Mesa is talking about here is when OCD is better, but depression still persists, right? So there is absolutely evidence-based treatment for depression, cognitive behavioral therapy and specific interventions that we can use to appropriately treat depression as a mental health disorder and as a standalone disorder. So I would recommend that you get that help. Sometimes OCD providers will treat both and feel really well-versed. Sometimes after the OCD is treated, they might refer out depending on severity and what makes sense for that individual patient. Yeah. Uh, the next question we have is, can people with OCD also have addictive personalities like addicted to drinking, video games, and other items. Absolutely, you know, so we see substance use disorders and other disorders be highly comorbid uh, with OCD, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody with OCD has an addictive uh, disorder as well. So you would want to get a full assessment. And remember, when you go to an OCD therapist, they should not just be asking OCD questions, right? They should be doing a full intake, so a full psychological assessment where we're really gathering as much information as possible to appropriately diagnose and create a treatment plan that'll work best for you. Yeah, this one's gonna be hard to give specifics, but maybe we can give some generalizations, but what are some examples of exposures I could do for harm OCD? I have a fear of harming my younger brothers and sisters. Yeah, you know, it's a great question, and it's one that can be really triggering. If you actually look, um, hey, where, how, this is my... <laughs> it's mirrored funny, so I always do Wherever that, this yeah. is, you know what I mean? <laughs> this is my jar of knives that I have in my office. So we slowly and systematically work our way up to exposures. Remember, harm exposures don't have to mean that we ask you to do something somebody else wouldn't be willing to do, but we will ask you to take risks that people without this type of OCD would have. Maybe carrying a pocket knife in your pocket and walking past your sibling is the highest level exposure that you do at the end, but maybe at the beginning it's saying a script and it's um, doing an uncertainty script and doing some harm exposures with people who aren't as triggering, you know, being willing to use a steak knife at a restaurant, those sort of things, but we slowly would work our way up to the ones that are the most triggering. And I would say the biggest one is, is live your values. It's important to connect with your siblings. So please, please, please don't allow OCD to take that away from you. Absolutely. Um, we have another live stream question at 951. How do you prevent a new compulsion from developing? I'll let you take this one, Chris. Yeah, I, I think that's super important to take a step back and recognize the mechanisms of OCD because OCD will do that. If you're starting to really fight and get better at harm OCD, OCD is going to start dropping that maybe you have fears of getting an illness and then you're going to combat that, do better in that, and then it's going to start to give you scrupulosity obsession. So this is what we really have to start doing is recognizing what OCD truly is. It's going to start giving you these intrusive, unwanted kind of fear thoughts, and it's going to need you to respond in some way, mental, physical, or both. And so when you start to understand the concept of OCD, I always tell people it's the same person with a different accent. Don't allow it to fool you. Don't allow it to be something that you're like, oh my God, this must be brand new. Oh no, what do I do? It's like, no, OCD is now just trying to have me shift from some other fear. So I always tell clients, we got to nip that in the bud. The good thing is that you don't have months or years of doing compulsions around this. So the great news is that you don't have just that habitual kind of component. But if you can nip it in the bud right before it starts, you'll notice that sure, it might be uncomfortable that first couple of weeks. But I've seen clients get a new obsession and we combat it. And within a couple of weeks, it's just not something that's affecting them anymore. So don't let it grow. And don't I will also grow. say that the more you're bought into the Right. This is what we're going to talk about next week, but it's the true concept of uncertainty versus ERP for each thing, right? So you could find yourself being triggered and doing new, new compulsions and then doing specific ERP for that. Or right away when you have an intrusive thought, you kind of laugh and you lean into it all the way so that it never even becomes a compulsion to begin with. Yeah, I have another DM'd question. It was, does anybody get better from OCD? I feel like I've been at this for years and haven't seen much progress. I love, I hate and love this question at the same time. So um, I'm sorry that you have to even ask this question. I think that it's really important for us to validate that everybody with OCD has a chance at living a successful, incredible life without OCD being burdensome. And nobody should accept a life of suffering because we accept this diagnosis. They do not have to go hand in hand absolutely people get better from OCD. In fact, the appropriate treatment for OCD has um, efficacy rates that far, like, like far blow, blow out of the water, blow other 
rates for other mental health conditions out of the water, right? So they are OCD and ERP. ERP is one of the most successful mental health interventions that exists. So we 100% know. And I just want to take a step back and tell you that Chris and I are not phonies. Um, We're not weird people that, you know, just get up here and say it, but like, we don't believe it. Like, we wouldn't be doing this work. We wouldn't be doing the work for IOCDF. We wouldn't be advocating. We certainly wouldn't have made careers out of something that we didn't believe worked and that we didn't believe could change lives. We are examples of lives that's changed ERP and OCD treatment has changed individually, but we also have seen it day after day with our patients. And that is the sole reason we continue doing the work that we do. Chris, if you want to wrap on a, wrap up on this, I think this would be a great ending place for us. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, everything you said, I, I think that that's why the work, that, that's why Liz and I both do this work. I mean, obviously not everybody who has OCD has to go into this field or advocate Uh, advocate, but I know that that's why Liz and I do it is we want to get this message out from people that lived with it is you don't have to suffer. I know for Liz and I, when we were first struggling, there weren't a lot of advocates, there weren't a lot of resources, and there weren't a lot of voices saying that we could get better. And I do believe that contributed to a lot of my depression, and a lot of my wanting to give up. And so it is so important for us that we have to get out there and spread the word that you can get better and that ERP works. And if you fight through it, you will absolutely be somebody like Liz and I, where we live in management. I mean, I always joke with people like taxes and traffic bother me more than OCD at this point in my life. So you can absolutely get better. We are messages of hope. And that's why we do what we do. And then what I always tell my clients and what I tell uh, other people I meet at conferences and stuff is that Liz and I want you to join us. We don't want to be the only two voices. So as you get better, you know, whether it's talking to a friend or doing things like this, getting the word out so other people can live with hope that they too can get better. 100%. So this is a perfect place for us to end. We didn't get to, I think, 75% of the questions. So I know we'll be back on and we will continue to answer your questions. It's so much fun for Chris and I to be together having this conversation. I would love if we could also find a way to have an even more interactive conversation. So maybe we'll keep thinking of of options to do that. But thank you all for joining. Um, I will end by saying what I believe and what is perfect for the last question. Help and hope are always available. Chris? Yeah, what I just want to say is thank you so much for the community. I mean, we really, Liz and I absolutely love when we get to do these Q&As. We'll be back in two weeks doing the same. Um, I think that's the 13th. Wednesday, but please come back. We love answering your questions. This is the most fun that we have together. So please be back. But like I said, we would not have had a successful live stream if it wasn't for the comments, the support and the questions in the chat. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Thanks y'all. See you next time.